We're now going to move on and have a look at the metopes from the Temple of Zeus at Olympia. Now, there were 12 of these in total, and as you can see from the sketch at the top, there were six at the front of the temple and six at the back, but they're not on the outside of the temple. We're looking at a cross section here. They're actually inside above the porch. So six across the front porch, the proneos, and six across the back porch, the epistodomos. Now, I've mentioned previously that metopes are perfect for showing self-contained little episodes, and that's exactly what's been done here. Each metope displays a different one of Heracles' 12 labours. And Olympia is even often considered to be responsible for canonising the order of these 12 labours because previously in literature there are lots and lots of variations as to which order he carried these out in. So that's something quite innovative about Olympia. There's also a geographical link to having Heracles depicted on this temple because not only does it link to the theme of competition overall at this important Pan-Hellenic sanctuary and home of the Olympic Games but in some myths Heracles may also have founded the Olympic Games. Uh, other possibilities are, are Zeus after throwing down a thunderbolt to the spot at which he was going to establish some new games or Pelops after his victory in the chariot race or perhaps even some funeral games for Pelops after his death. Don't forget Pelops was actually worshipped at the site of Olympia. There is a Pelopeion or a tomb at which um, his worship was centred around. Something also very innovative about the way in which the labours of Heracles are depicted on this temple is that he is shown to age over the course of the 12 metopes. So I'm showing you the earliest one there, which is the Nemean lion, and he has got no beard. He's cleanly shaven. And then one of the later in the set of 12, where he is holding up the sky, this is the apple of the Hesperides, and he's now grown that beard and looks to be a more mature male. There's also the fact that he's humanised in his body language or his reactions. Now, if we look at the Nemean lion, obviously uh, he's won that challenge. He's defeated the Nemean lion, having strangled it uh, and then flayed it with its own claws. But he looks absolutely exhausted from having carried out this task. And so the demigod aspect of Heracles, the relatable aspect for the viewers who are looking at this, is very much put across. And it's that idea that he too has faced monstrous challenges, but has been able to overcome them. Uh, and that's a really nice message for anybody viewing that particular set. We're now looking at the Cretan bull metope. Now, when you're analysing a piece of architectural sculpture, remember that one of the things that we're considering is how well it actually fits the shape and the space available to it. So in the case of a metope, it's the square. In the case of a pediment, for example, it's the triangle shape. And in fact, this one does it really, really well. The hardest bit of a metope to fill is actually the, the four corners. But by having crossing diagonals, we've got um, each part of that square cleverly filled, especially the corners. Not only that, but the crossing diagonals are also really helpful in terms of the narrative too, because we get a real sense of conflict between Heracles and the bull. And that's enhanced by the fact that they also look back at one another as well, really kind of drawing your attention to the fact that they are squaring up to one another. Notice how Heracles is the one in front He's the one overlapping the bull, which has, I suppose, two advantages. One, it shows us that he's the one that's in charge. He's the superior uh, person in this engagement or this conflict. But it also allows us to see his anatomy and to show off the heavily defined musculature and to see just how strong this demigod is. And don't forget that this metope is made in the early classical period. And this is a time when musculature is very much idealised and exaggerated and we get those heavy iliac crests and cuirass aesthetics. Um, on top of that as well, it's just worth considering that 
The apples of the Hesperides metope has an altogether different feel to the Cretan bull labour. Um, for a start, we've got the vertical and horizontal lines. Whereas the diagonal lines usually signify action and dynamism, the vertical and horizontal lines are more about stillness. And that really fits with the, the mood of this scene, which of course is Heracles holding up the world for Atlas. So that is going to be a task which takes um, a lot of strength and concentration. There's going to be very little action naturally in this scene. But we've still got things of interest to consider, even with the very still scene. So for a start, there's a variety in poses. If you have a look at Athene, she's facing entirely to the front in terms of her body. Whereas we've got Heracles himself in the middle in side profile. And then we've got Atlas in three quarter profile, turning slightly towards us as the viewer. We've also got some mirroring in the hands or the arms of Athene and Heracles, which really helps reinforce the fact that she is his patron goddess and she's there to support him in his endeavours. We've also got the fact that Athene's peplos, with its beautiful folds, adds pattern and variety with the nudity of the two male figures to her right-hand side. And all three figures reach the full height of the metope, making it successful in terms of filling the space uh, that's available for them. One final thing I wanted to point out is just Athene's appearance here, because we're going to contrast it with the next metope, the Augean stables. Look how she is youthful and matronly. She's not the goddess of war. She's much softer in her appearance. And we're going to have a look at how the sculptor has changed her in just a moment. Finally, you're looking at that last metope on our syllabus, the Augean stables. And i am come to Athene first, because we just finished talking about her with the apples of the Hesperides metope. And notice how now she is the goddess of war that we know her to be. She's got her shield down by her side. She's got her helmet on. And presumably that would be her spear in her hand that she was using to point towards where Heracles should be digging to divert that river. So she too has essentially matured over the course of the Metopes, just like Heracles did, which of course is innovative, but very unusual because, you know, from mythology, the Homeric hymns tells us that Athene was born as an adult from the head of Zeus, already in her armour. But this is just, I suppose, a different way. And the Greeks certainly didn't seem to have any problems with there being lots of discrepancies and different variations of the stories surrounding their gods and heroes. Now, in terms of the composition of this one, because it's an active scene and Heracles is seeking to divert the river to wash all of the muck out of the stables, uh, we can see the use of diagonal lines again. So um, the, certainly from Heracles with his hands and also with Athene, as I previously mentioned, and her spear. But notice again the mirroring, the fact that their arms are parallel. So we get this idea of her as a patron goddess again with Heracles there in his endeavours. Once more, we can contrast the pattern in Athene's peplos with the nudity of Heracles next to her. And finally, if we think about the fact as well that Heracles, whilst active, engaged in his task, is still facing us, the viewer, full anatomy in terms of the abdominal muscles there for us to engage with and view. It really helps support that theory from Robin Osborne that temples are where we come face to face with gods and heroes.